The battle between Manchester United star Marcus Rashford and Downing Street over free school meals has resumed this week. So in round one, Rashford campaigned for free school meals to continue over the summer holidays. So normally free school meals are something you get when you go into school because of the lockdown, because schools were closed, they were introduced as vouchers. Um, the government had argued that they wouldn't be giving out those vouchers during the summer term because it's not an, during the summer holidays, apologies, because it's not the normal time uh, when kids would get free school meals. Rashford launched a really successful campaign against that, got loads of, against the fact that they'd be cut for the summer holidays, got loads of traction, um, ended up getting support from the Labour Party who put forward an opposition motion. Um, which looked like it, it was going to win and the government had to U-turn. So people on low incomes got vouchers for free school meals throughout the summer. Um, what Marcus Rashford has noticed now and why we're in round two of this fight is because whilst the government were willing to pay for free school meal vouchers in the summer um, for, for students on low income, sort of accepting that in the coronavirus crisis, people are short of cash and you shouldn't let kids go hungry in the summer during a global pandemic. I mean, in my mind, you shouldn't let them go hungry anytime, but I'm putting you in the head of the Tory logic on this. Um, but they don't want to do the same for this half term and for the Christmas holidays, even though, as you know, anyone can see, we're still in the middle of a global pandemic and loads of people are out of work and it's a it's going to be a really difficult Christmas for, for many people. Um, Marcus Rashford has rightly come out and said, um, you know, you need to do this again. You need to provide school meal vouchers for people over half term and over the winter. He's been promoting a petition. Um, let's get up the tweet from Marcus Rashford, which was from late last week. So this is sort of really sparking um, the next round um, in, this, in this battle. Um, so Marcus Rashford tweeted, the British public care 225k and rising. And then a link to the, the petition, which at this point 225k people have signed. We will accept no less than the free ask. There are 1.5 million children we are not reaching with the free school meal scheme because of the universal credit cap. 1.5 million children in the UK in 2020 with no support. And then we can go take a look at those free demands. Um, so it says the expansion of free school meals to every child from a household on universal credit or equivalent, reaching an additional 1.5 million 7 to 16 year olds. Expansion of holiday provision, food and activities to support all children on free school meals, reaching an additional 1.1 million children. And free increasing the value of the Healthy Start vouchers to £4.25 per week and expanding into all those on universal credit or equivalent, reaching an additional 290,000 pregnant women and children under the age of four. Now, I mean, something that Marcus Rashford is very good at doing, I mean, obviously using his platform to try and achieve, you know, great ends, is he puts stuff in, you know, it's, it's so difficult to disagree with that. How, how can you disagree with giving enough money so that kids can have good meals throughout the school holidays? How could you possibly oppose that? Well, there was a vote on it today in Parliament. So just like last time, Labour have sort of backed up Marcus Rashford's campaign by putting forward an opposition debate. Um, this time it went to a vote and it lost. Um, so Conservative MPs voted against the free school meals for a, for a million children. It was defeated 322 to 261 votes. Um, appalling, tragic. If one of your MPs voted against this, write him a letter now because they're a disgrace. Um, but what I do want to show you now is, is how they are defending this. Because obviously you have to tell yourself quite a quite a complicated story to justify you know, withdrawing meals from people, from kids on low incomes. But they do manage it. So this was Tory Minister Paul Scully defending his plan at that time to vote against extending free school meal vouchers over the holidays. Do you want to feed hungry children or not? That's a simple question. Some of the Conservative colleagues have already come out. Anne-Marie Morris has tweeted she'll be supporting us. I think Robert Halfham is on his way to supporting us. This is a matter of conscience. It's about principles before party. Are you going to put money forward to feed hungry children in one of the toughest winters of our generation or not? And oh. if you're not going to, you have to go back to your constituencies and face the music. We've had a situation where um, children are um, in, been going hungry in, uh, under a Labour government um, for years. What we've done, we've put a universal credit system in place, which allows flexibility for people to go back to work and, and then topping up their, their, their incomes so they don't have the cliff edge of the old benefit system that we saw under the previous Labour government. So, so we are, have been starting to tackle those issues of the people that are at that, that point 
on the on the pay scale and making sure that their children can get fed. Paul, did but you th say that, that that children have gone hungry for years? Is that an admission? I mean, is that acceptable? People, no, in terms, no, no, it's not. Which is why I'm saying that we we're actually being looking at how we can help parents over a long over the long term, rather than uh, the, the 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 kind of uh, uh, situation that Tulip is, is sorting out. What can we do that's actually going to mean that the lowest paid can can actually um, help feed their children for weeks, months and years to come. That will be increasing the national living wage that we'd be doing. Introducing the flexible universal credit that allows them to top up and go back to work, yes. which ultimately is the best way of, 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 of making sure right. that you can um, work with your children and give them Look, the, Laura, the, the lifestyle. Their minds children have gone hungry for years. That's his... <laughs> that's his justification to the country but also to himself why he's happy to vote to take away free school meal vouchers for children um, on low incomes when they're out of school term so we say no no people have gone hungry for years during half term so this is a normal year um, so kids should go hungry again I mean for one it's not a normal year I mean there is unemployment and people struggling with incomes to a much greater degree than they have you know in, re in recent memory because of this coronavirus pandemic but also how is people have always gone hungry so now they should go hungry you know how is that a good argument it's it's unbelievable the way that their arguments work as conservatives, you know, it's kind of a, on a par with you use an iPhone, therefore, therefore you can't criticize capitalism. It's like, well, you know, you could have found that there, there were children who couldn't find food in 2009 if you looked hard enough. We know the data is around 2.3, 2.6 million children were in relative child poverty in 2009 10. That was the last year of the Labour government. Before this pandemic, i.e., last year, that had gone up to 4.1 million. So it's, it's almost doubled. Clearly, with COVID, it's, it's going to go far higher still. And the idea that, well, parents going into work, having the minimum wage topped up, it's not a living wage, it's a minimum wage, will help them. It is categorically untrue. Anybody who wants to do their research, and this is more than welcome to do so, go online, look at the data regarding in-work poverty. You're more likely to be in poverty now if you're in a household with somebody that works than that doesn't. That's quite a new development. And you can basically map on the rise of child poverty within work poverty. And this isn't new. This has been... This has been out there for a very, very long time. So rise in child poverty aren't because people haven't got jobs. It's because they have jobs and they're not being paid enough or they can't get the hours. And this is now going to be exacerbated with COVID. Either people are having their hours cut or they're going to be on furlough or they've lost their job altogether. So it just seems just an utterly ridiculous thing to say. How many children will be living in re relative poverty by the end of this year? You know, we, we might be looking at six, seven million. I mean, we don't know. That that could be the ballpark, even though it was 4.1 million at the beginning of last year. That would be, you know, an order of four times greater than the last Labour government. So for every kid in poverty then, you've got four now. Let's be real. That's a, that's a really shambolic way to run a country. That wasn't 100 years ago. It was 10 years ago. Uh, and the money's there. You know, was, was um, uh, eat out to help out? Was that? creating a dependency culture? The fact that I could go to Nando's and eat a lunch for five pounds? No, because they assumed you were already middle class and middle class people can't be dependent. It's only working class people who can be dependent on the state. It's only their benefits who have to be cut. I want to go um, to some more Tory justifications of this. And I mean, stupidly, um, many Tory MPs decided that they were going to express their opposition um, to the free school meals campaign um, by getting into a Twitter row with one of the country's most popular people, Marcus Rashford, Man United striker. Um, so to introduce this, I want to first start with the tweet that both of them were responding to. So it's, it's Ben Bradley and Steve Baker who respond, but they're responding to this tweet from Marcus Rashford this morning. So paying close attention to the commons today and to those who are willing to turn a blind eye to the needs of our most vulnerable children. 2.2 million of them who currently qualify for free school meals, 42% newly registered, not to mention the 1.5 million children who currently don't qualify. Um, so he's saying paying close attention to the Commons because there was going to be that debate and that vote. It has been lost because the Tories voted against it. But let's go to these responses. So Tory MP Ben Bradley um, decided to wade in and give his sort of justification for why, or his explanation of why he believed Marcus Rashford was wrong on this government has a lot of responsibilities supporting the vulnerable helping people to help themselves balancing the books not as simple as you make out marcus extending free school meals to school holidays passes responsibility for feeding kids away from parents to the state it increases dependency we've already said you know 
dependency is something in, in this Tory ideology that only applies to working class people, middle class people who are dependent on the state. That's fine. Industries which are only viable, Circo, because the government will hand them huge contracts, 12 billion contracts to not do their job properly. I mean, that's dependency culture. But even, you know, apart from that, even if you if you take away the politics from this and just, just look at this from a, a human level, what he is suggesting there, that, and even, even if you think that, you know, people should be disciplined to go back to work, otherwise they'll have financial difficulties, whatever, even if you buy into that sort of neoliberal, neoclassical ideology that you have to incentivize people to go back to work by making them poor, he is genuinely suggesting that we should leverage hungry kids to discipline their parents. So we're saying, how do we get parents to work harder? Not to, I mean, we're obviously in the middle of a pandemic. There aren't jobs if even people decide, to, well, it's not a decision anyway. But what, We don't the, want them to work. The point, the point I, we the don't virus. want them to make, because yeah, they'll spread the virus. But the point I want to make is that he there is, is genuinely suggesting the way we get parents to behave in a way that we like, which is, you know, as rational, um, utility maximizing workers, is to leverage the suffering of their kids. And also, I mean, an important point to make about dependency here, right? is and this is sort of like a, a standard sort of marxist or social democratic idea about dependency which is that workers are dependent on their bosses to some extent and the more that the alternative to working in any job is you know complete horror the more dependent they are so if you live in a, a decent welfare state in in sweden in the 1970s i mean to, a, to an extent it's still decent you've got your healthcare guaranteed you've got your housing guaranteed you're guaranteed that your your child isn't going to starve if you get fired by your boss you have the security to organize against your boss you have the security to maybe decide oh no i don't want that job because they don't treat me right i'm going to hold out and wait till i can get a job which i feel is more suited to me where i'm treated better um, where my dignity is respected now, that's possible if you've got this sort of safety net behind you. But if a worker is told, you either keep this job, you either take that job, or your kid starves, how much power does that give that boss? You know, if that boss is someone who's committing sexual harassment in the workplace, and you tell the mum, well, if you, if you don't have a job, then that's your responsibility and your kid should starve. That is making that person so much more dependent on a boss than anyone will ever be dependent on the state. It's crazy, isn't it? It's just we're, we're, we, are, we are looking square in the face at an utterly depraved genre of politics, utterly depraved, completely devoid of any ethics. Because they, they would then say, well, you, shouldn't, you should have thought twice about that before you had a child. You might be sexually you know, harassed one day. Well, there's, there's laws against this. That's not how it works. Uh, I mean, it's just we're, we're looking at people with absolutely no ethical compass whatsoever who are more likely to get upset about being called scum in the House of Commons than voting for a, a, a you know voting against a proposed piece of legislation which would keep a million kids away from hunger over the next several months which do you think is more important I know I'm we're gonna get up another another this 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 tweet exchange is even dumber um, this is from Steve Baker who Marcus Rashford wholly owns. So Stephen Baker is a sort of, or Steve Baker, sort of a hardcore Brexiteer backbencher. Um, so in response um, to that particular tweet um, from Marcus Rashford, which I read earlier, Baker, Steve Baker quote tweeted it, no one will be turning a blind eye and it is wrong to suggest anyone would. Not destroying the currency with excessive QE is also one of our duties. Now this is bananas so the he is crazy i mean he's the craziest mp on the tory benches the policy before sort of extending free school meals over the summer holidays cost 120 million pounds now half term and the christmas holidays are only three weeks one week add two weeks so it's half of that so we're talking about 60 million pounds and he thinks that 60 million pounds is going to mean we have to print so much money that it destroys the pound well, presumably he's talking about the fact that we are going to run at, at least a £200 billion deficit this year, probably significantly higher. But in any case, like you say, more's the reason. If we're spending a deficit of £200 billion, what difference is £120 million going to make? And by the way, you're not particularly productive if you're starving, right? There are some basics that we need to, uh, we need to think about here. But he is the most crazy. You know, he wants Britain to go back to the gold standard, Michael. So uh, he, he is particularly ridiculous and evil. Um, and you might have noticed if you had a keen eye, we can get that up one more time, that same tweet. Um, because at the bottom, it says the only people who can reply to this 
are people who follow Steve Baker or people mentioned in it. So he's sort of calling out Marcus Rashford um, with this idiotic point, And he hasn't let Marcus Rashford reply to him. Uh, so Marcus Rashford, smart guy that he is, uh, quote tweets Steve Baker. We can get this up. He says, at least turn on your comments and let me respond, Steve. I very much welcome conversation on this. Um, and then the most surreal bit is Steve Baker's response to this. You have 3.4 million followers, Marcus, to my 96K. The power is yours here. Everyone knows feeding hungry children is a top priority. I'd like to see universal credit boosted. But if the economy and currency collapse, the poor will be devastated. Alleging a blind eye is just wrong. Now, we've already talked about why it's ridiculous to suggest that paying £60 million for some poor kids to have free school meals is not going to collapse the currency. This is someone who wanted a no-deal Brexit, by the way. He's spent the last four years fighting for a no-deal Brexit, which is, I mean, I don't think it would be the worst thing to ever happen, but one thing it's not going to have a good effect on is the value of the pound. So this guy thinks that a no-deal Brexit, um, which has already cost billions in preparation, is going to be more damaging to the currency than £60 million to make sure that Michael. poor kids... The more ridiculous bit here, though is is this idea that you have more power than me like only one of you there's marcus rashford and then there's stephen baker only one of you got to vote today in parliament on the motion to extend free school meals over half term and the winter holidays it was steve baker steve baker voted against it so he said oh, i might be elected an mp i might be the person who makes the law but if you've got more twitter followers than me you're more powerful than me such an online comment isn't it i, I may have you know I may be one of 650 legislators in this country, but, you know, how many engagements did I get this month compared to you? Not much. People are saying, by the way, people are saying in the comments, this story is a bit too online. I don't think that's, I don't think that's fair, and I'll tell you why. Normally, I agree that it's important not to obsess over social media stories. I agree with that entirely. But I think clearly that the, the, the scope for pushback in terms of the government's mismanagement on COVID is quite limited because people can't protest. People can't go into meetings. People can't do all the things, the associated things that would normally happen uh, in a political crisis. That's, that's, that's how people respond collectively. And so I think in a, in a moment like that, yeah, this is going to be one of the primary ways we, we're going to see uh, rifts and, you know, uh, pushback, whether it's through local politicians like Andy Burnham, you know, and, and that was incredibly mediatized. Yeah, of course, I'd prefer 100,000 people on a demo or a general struck. Of course, I would. But realistically, in the context of a pandemic, that's not going to happen. These kinds of stories in that context, I think, really matter. The obvious thing in, in response to it is very online is that there was a vote in Parliament today on it, right? So, so there was a, a material opportunity for the Tories to change their policy. They did change it last time, which shows that this kind of thing matters. I mean, obviously, him being a top Man United in England striker, means that he does have a lot of influence. And I think there are many Tories who worry that this is doing them damage, the fact that they haven't U-turned again this time. And as to the tweets, I mean, why I like looking at Tory MPs' Twitter feeds is, is not so much because I think, you know, obviously the electorate doesn't read Tory MPs' Twitter feeds, but what they do expose is their justifications for doing things. Because I think often, you know, sometimes they get caught out when they go on TV, but in their official communications, normally they've at least got, you know, a, a PR person to say, I'm not sure you should say that. You know, that makes you sound like a psychopath. But when it's just them on Twitter, they're a bit like, no, 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 no. Poor kids should go hungry, otherwise the parents won't bother working. You know, that wouldn't go out in an official communication. But on their Twitter, they, they're stupid enough to think that's a, a convincing argument. Yeah.